next up, we have one more speaker. I am very excited to introduce um, Travis Oliphant. He is the creator of SciPy and NumPy and the co-founder of NumFocus, a nonprofit de dedicated to providing financial support to open source projects and educational programs for scientific computing. He has been on the forefront of finding sustainable business models for open source, notably as the founder of Anaconda and most recently Quantsite. He received his PhD from the Mayo Clinic Graduate School in Rochester, Minnesota, where he worked on MR elastography reconstruction techniques. Um, and we are delighted to welcome him back to the MRI community for this program. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate Hi. that. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's exciting to be here. I, it's been a while since I've had a chance to communicate and talk to <laughs> the MRI community. Although I was, I have gone to some cancer centers and to some hospitals and talked to doctors still. I really, really love, uh, I got my start in, in MRI as an academic, and I still have an affinity towards that. I really love seeing the portable MRI. That was one of the things I thought about as a professor. How do we build MRIs more cheaply and more inexpensively? So. Maybe we can have a conversation later um, uh, about Hyperfine. I'm mean, looking forward to that, especially if you use Python for the software. Let's talk about how we can help you uh, do that even more efficiently and better. But anyway, I, uh, I guess I'll share my screen and then just get started. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, hopefully uh, I've been known to take too long, so I'll try to go pretty quick okay. And some of this. Uh, let's see, if I share my screen, um, let me see if it works just to share this has everybody seen yes okay thank you and laura let me know if, if something doesn't come off okay and it's it's okay so i do have a few conflicts of interest i'm going to be talking about open teams and anaconda quonsite a few other things i i do have a commercial interest in those things uh but hopefully my talk today is going to be mostly focused on the concepts and nothing really about um, really selling too much here, mostly just talking about ideas. Uh, my name is Travis Oliphant. I am actually currently, yes, I founded Quonsite in 2018, but in 2020, we started to really promote and push the, the ambition of open teams. And I'll talk a little bit about what they all look like. But first, I wanna just give a little background about me. Like uh, Laura said, I did get my start in MRI. Really before that, it was electromagnetic imaging of Earth's systems using satellite data. I kind of got involved in software and then that kind of led me off onto a cliff working around uh, open source software development. So I had the chance to be part of a lot of communities, a lot of technologies over the past 20 years and some of those have become really popular. And so it's really exciting to see how much they've been used. Generally, I'm a passionate scientist. I love math, I love science, I love, um, I really loved MRI. I thought it was a fantastic technology and I still think it's fascinating. I ended up really getting excited about open source communities as well. And then because of that, got excited about entrepreneurship and business and how do we actually help make more of the things we all love. I started in computational science, measuring backscatter of the Earth's oceans primarily, but could also see the, the greens, the Amazon rainforest and the ice sheets and basically Earth observation. Uh, ended up, that's got me excited about taking data and inverting it to get information. Went to the Mayo Clinic where I studied with Richard Robb and Dr. Gre um, Amen and Greenfield. Greenleaf, excuse me, and studied um, lots of things, but primarily MRI elastography. This is a project where I ended up learning Python, was trying to solve a problem of reconstructing waves, propagating in the body that were measured with ultrasound and MRI. It was an exciting uh, discovery at MRI uh, at Mayo in the 1990s, late 1990s. But this led me to Python basically, and then doing that work I started to develop a project called SciPy, which is basically how do I take and make accessible codes from in Fortran and make them available to users of Python, which is an open source language that was created in 91 and very accessible language. Kind of uh, writing Python was like writing executable pseudocode, executable English sometimes people would say. And then it had this burgeoning community that was growing. And then basically it was at the age where the internet was allowing communities to come together quickly. And so it wasn't as difficult to share information. You shared code and then people could update that code. And that has evolved over the past 20 years to some enormous and ex very accelerating cooperative communities, which has led also to some challenges, those communities. And kind of, I really appreciate the dialogue here between both closed and open and come of the, the benefits and the challenges of each. I think that's an important dialogue to continue. 
Um, SciPy itself is basically a distribution. Masquerading is a single library. Pretty soon, the, the scope of what could be a scientific library is distributed was just massive. It's much bigger than one library. And so ultimately, it kind of divided into scikits and multiple other libraries, thousands and thousands of other libraries, actually. But SciPy was sort of a start of how do we do this together in the, in the Python space? And it still has a set of foundational functional tools. Um, I ended up doing more imaging as a professor. And as a professor at BYU, that's where I actually working on scanning impedance. I did some portable MRI work. None of it did some fMRI work as well. Uh, didn't really publish on those. Ended up publishing on some scanning impedance imaging work I was doing. But then I was still pretty addicted to open source communities and open source software. So I ended up writing a lot more software. Um, and uh, that ended up making it hard to get tenure. I mean, I, I split the, the department, frankly. They, they, I, was a, I had a bimodal vote and half the people said, well, he's kind of more excited about open source than, than academics. And half were like, man, we got to keep this guy's amazing work. So I ended up making it very difficult for everybody. But ultimately I was getting addicted to entrepreneurship and trying to build companies. And so that I just decided to move on. But NumPy was what I'm what a lot of people started to use. And this itself was trying to unify things. It was basically like a, I felt a duty to write it. It wasn't that, oh, here's this great thing I had to do. It was like, oh, the world is splitting. We've got this nascent Python community all building around uh, libraries that are really cool. SciPy was my baby. I loved what was happening in the SciPy community, but there was other libraries starting to emerge. In fact, one was a uh, um, NB image, which, which had morphology. And morphology was being written on NumArray, which is a different array library than the SciPy libraries I was writing were on numeric. So I was like, this isn't good. We're gonna have all this split. So I ended up writing this unification library called NumPy, building on the shoulders of the giants that created numeric and NumArray. In fact, that's one of the important things to realize is any successful open source project happens because of thousands of people that make it happen. It's really, that's the, that's the interesting phenomena is how to, what do you get emerging from thousands of inter interactions of many, many people? And it's interesting, it's, been, it's, it's a fascinating thing to understand. And there is a role to play with companies. Entrepreneurship has a role to play. There's some, it's important things that companies can still do and do need to do. So how do they work together efficiently and effectively? That's kind of become my life's, my life's work now, basically. My little side projects that I was doing to advance a scientific experiment or an imaging technique I was trying to do, they basically became my life. And I kind of made the journey from mad scientist to developer to corny haired boss, basically. <laughs> Um, an investor and venture uh, capitalist eventually. Uh, so that's kind of, maybe that's a story a lot of people follow. But one of the things, I mean, you can kind of see over history, I've had a chance to be a part of lots of interesting projects. Most recently after, you know, NumPy, SciPy were very academic. I left academia in 2007, about 14 years ago. Uh, actually moved to Texas and then have since that time have worked at companies. Still cooperating with my academic friends whenever possible to build software always looking for how can I make open source software the foundation and imp improving and supporting communities and helping more communities grow. That's what's been driving me ever since. What's been really cool is the work we did has had huge impact. I've just been amazed actually at how much these tools that you know our little gang of friends were writing have ended up just being used all over the world and all kinds of had a chance to meet wonderful, amazing scientists all over the world doing very interesting work. I was just actually Googling MRI and noticing there's a lot of software out there doing MRI. I was grateful to hear that there's uh, Python software is underlying the uh, portable imaging machine, the portable MRI machine. That was fantastic. And I know it's because the work of all my friends in this community who have been trying to make Python more accessible, more accessible computing. There's an enormous, it's bigger than I know, but here's, you know, at some point I try to kind of understand what's the layering. There's Python and a bunch, a bunch of base tools, then a bunch of tools on top of that. Effect, effectively, it's, it's been a joke, but kind of it's true. If you just kind of Google or search for, you know, something I'm interested in and Python, you'll probably get some open source tools out there. And the search, uh, the search tools have been really effective at helping us coordinate together at scale. So basically Python has taken over. I mean, I think back to 20 years ago and the idea of, hey, we really want to make this tool that many people can use, but man, what's, what's, it's hard. How are we going to do this? We have no money. We have no venture investment. We're trying to make, do this kind of as a grassroots effort. I'd be amazed. I'd really be floored if we said, actually, what's going to happen is everyone's going to use it. It's going to be all over the world. There'll be millions of users. Awesome. Uh, so we, we've won, and kind of sort of, though. <laughs> I'd say we've won, but we really haven't necessarily succeeded in solving some of the fundamental problems in sustainability. So open source has taken over the world of software. This is something many people don't realize is 96% of the world's software 
includes open source. I think this is trending to 100%. I think eventually all software will have be based and be depending on some open source components. And then 57% of the code is open source. I don't think this will ever be 100%. I think there is going to be space for proprietary software for all kinds of reasons. Uh, but I do think it'll kind of probably grow to about 75%. That's my prediction. About 75% of the world's software will be open source. But there'll be that layer that is still proprietary. And we'll talk about kind of how I see that in the, in the future. But the problem is, how do we actually make that sustainable, make that work? In my, in my world, NumPy, Matplotlib, Pandas, these have been very popular libraries that lots of people have used. But the main developers of those libraries never got paid to work on it. They're just doing it in their spare time or borrowing it from a job or you know, sacrificing tenure to write it. There's lots of stuff people have done. They think, well, is that really a thing we can bank on? Or is well, just the world will be full of people like that? They'll just do this? Um, so, you know, I personally have had, to, I, I have had to do it with a big family. I have lots of, I, I had three kids when I was writing SciPy. I had six by the time I was writing uh, NumPy. I've always known I have to support them. Uh, that's the decision my wife and I made is I would be the one supporting the family. And so we basically, I, I love just being open source, but I had to have a job. I had to keep, I had to work. So how? Uh, that's why for me, I sort of was pushed into thinking about entrepreneurship and thinking about economics. So there are problems today. And listen, you see all kinds of news about this too. And I don't have all the answers, but I have some observations. You see things like currently, one of the challenges is the big uh, cloud vendors. Like the big companies are all making cloud compute the thing they sell. And okay, great, that's easy. And then you have software on top. They're all pulling open source left and right to make their stuff useful. But none of that flows back or very little of that flows back. Fortunately, it's not quite none now, but very little flows back to the communities that actually create it. So that's not necessarily great. That's not necessarily gonna help. So, you know, you basically, there's basically lots of examples of problems when a bug is found and then lots of open source leaders represent they don't have what they need. They don't have the open source resources they need. This is an ongoing problem, lots of people understand. It, the foundation is kind of this tragedy of the commons and many people don't understand this. It's basically if you have a, a resource that everybody uses, pretty soon everybody uses it and overgrazes it. If the grass in this case is the, the open source developers and maintainers, the sheep being users of the code or, or your proprietary companies that use it and don't ever give back, then pretty soon you end up not, you kind of destroy the thing you had. Uh, so there's lots of things here. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. I had some slides here from a previous talk, uh, but there's a lot of really important knowledge here. I, I think we need better dialogue. I think there's a lot of um, debates over capitalism, socialism, but I don't think any of the answers are there. I think we need to think more generally about, there's a great book called Radical Markets. It's interesting. I think there's other writings like that. To me, I've just been experimenting this world by doing. I've just been, I see business and open source are about the same thing. Voluntary activities, you're competing to cooperate with people. How do you organize people to compete to cooperate? I personally love both of these activities, helping people and groups of people. So to me, it's a very happy union. Although to some people, I'm you know too uh, too populist to be a great uh, BBC, and to other and to a great business person, and to others, I'm too much of a business person to be a great open source enthusiast. But I think both of those, I reject both of those claims, and I think you can find a happy um, have, have them both thrive to together um so i had a, like i said i had kids this is a little picture of me as a building an actual mr simulator uh, i built a cloud of computers way back and i'm not that far back but it was basically i just used mpi uh choosing that over um M mpi over pvm and then basically wrote in c plus plus an mri simulator that was uh, used 20 computers hooked together from old macs that the mayo clinic was just discarding so that was a fun little project that taught me about the internet, but I also read about open source. I read, you know, Richard Stallman and Eric Raymond. These were sort of early heroes that I read. And uh, Richard Stallman had the idea, he said something, I said, wait, this isn't gonna work. He said, basically, I urge you to as I have done and have no children. That's how we're gonna make open source work is people who are in it don't have kids. I'm like, uh, well, I already have three. So I think that's not gonna work for me. What am I gonna do now? So I couldn't really follow that advice. I had to think, well, something's missing there. So what do we do now? How can I work on open source to support my family? How do economies work? How do you make people better off? I'm gonna quickly go through these slides, but I basically discovered a, a body of economic thought called Austrian econ economics, Hedrick Hayek, Ludwig Monsess. There's actually a great book by Jesus Puerto. Key takeaways from this is coordinating power of money and profits. It's actually really important for people to coordinate their activity by charging. Like money and profits really an important signal for how do millions of people cooperate together and exchange their, their labor. In that, entrepreneurs are critical and the structure of capital is critical. 
So a lot of times we have these words to name one thing, but actually the thing we're talking about is very detailed and very big and very diverse. And so we have to be careful we don't just throw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. There's a lot of detail here. And that was very fascinating to find that there's actually a lot of people written about this, even if I hadn't read it. Um, I really like voluntary trade requiring win-win situations. And finding those win-wins is fun. Finding those opportunities where people both benefit, that's actually the heart of interactions at scale. And lots of people doing that is how we make the world a better place. So lots of people searching for these win-wins is entrepreneurship in action. It's trial and error. It's the scientific method applied to the problem of human organization. I was, I was intellectually stimulated by that notion, got super excited and said, I got to do more entrepreneur, entrepreneurship. Uh, there are problems. There's traps, externalities. They do exist. And there's local minima where you um, get stuck in suboptimal outcomes. That's absolutely true. So good thinking, new organizations, structures of organizations, more experimentation, lots of stuff needed to help us escape those. How you think matters. So um, one essential solution is grow and create many businesses that create open source ecosystems. That's basically what I wanted to do. And I want to be part of something that did that. So early on, as a, even as a professor, I was trying to do this. I was trying to raise money for my lab at BYU. So I, I, I made a Christmas DVD. My wife has a beautiful voice and I actually gave her voice, uh, her, her a CD she made out and I raised $5,000. Okay, that was awesome, cool. Uh, wasn't that effective, but kind of gave, gave some. I wrote a book. Actually, when I wrote NumPy, I wrote a book called Guide to NumPy, self-published it. I had a market-determined copyright where basically uh, it would be given away in four years or win $250,000. So I basically put a price on the idea of an IP rather than just, oh, it's patented or it's, or it's copyrighted and you can't do anything with it. I said, well, yeah, I'm gonna use a copyright until I make a certain amount of money. So there's like, I, I need this much. And I looked at kind of what it took and what I needed. And I said, 250,000. If I got that much, I would free the material from all restrictions. So um, I ended up selling 3000 copies over two years, $90,000. Most of that went to my students uh, that I use it to fund my students at the lab. I didn't have really other funding for a PhD student. It, it worked It worked interestingly, actually. Now that I know how to market better, I probably could have done a much better job. Uh, and that probably could have raised more. There are, there are keys to do that better. Um, eventually, I was at a job and I made the material public domain anyway because I had another job and a different thing I was doing. So, but those are kind of things that got me in that entrepreneurial mode. And then ultimately, I worked at a company, learned about businesses, and then created two organizations in 2012, Anaconda and NumFocus. Intentionally, NumFocus saying, look, we need a sustainable organization that's a nonprofit. That's all it's doing is being a nonprofit and a place that can own the copyright, that can be the legal entity, so that these a lot of other companies can thrive that use the same nonprofit. So there's a place for nonprofits, and I really I, we wanted to create one. So we did, and it's thrived, it's grown. There's lots of fiscal sponsored projects it has. You can go to its website, it's still an ongoing concern, it's doing very well. And a conda, we wanted to be a venture back company, go get investment from companies. So we did, we did that. And that's grown, and that's grown pretty well too. I mean, there's a lot more detail I can go into there, but won't today. <laughs> But so nonprofits are important fabric. Nonprofits, this is really succeeding in helping become a home for Jupyter Lab, for NumPy, for SciPy, for all these open source libraries. If you have an open source library that's for the benefit of science, NumFocus can really help you kind of be a fiscal sponsor and help you be a place that isn't one company. It's a nonprofit organization, charitable organization. It also hosts the PyData events. And actually the events are how the NumFocus itself. Lots of events in the PyData space really, really, really took off. That was very useful. And then um, NumPy led to the creation of QuanSight. QuanSight is a, a services organization with three things, services, labs, initiate. The initiate was the interesting one to me. Services and labs are basically open source consulting. And, that, and, you can, and that's a known thing. You can build an open source software, do consulting on it, and help pay people to continue to improve those softwares. There's some challenges. Initiate was a... Let's do a, a venture fund, a venture fund whose proceeds backs open source. So labs is tied to initiate and the benefit and it'll benefit uh, labs. And I think every single venture company should have an open source research and development lab. There should be the proceeds that carried interest from venture capital investments. Some of that should go to fund open source research just directly. That's one advice I have for anybody who's thinking about, about building venture funds. And there's a lot of folks out there who there's millions and trillions of dollars actually investor money looking for gain. And there's lots of people earning money when that gain is happening. Some of that needs to go to fund open source. I think it's very straightforward to do that. We're doing that actually pretty successfully recently. Um, open Teams is the latest venture and Open Teams is saying, hey, this quantity is awesome. Let's scale it to every open source ecosystem. 
Quonsite starts with what I know, the NumPy pay, pay to the ecosystem, but there are 5 million open source projects. About 500,000 are being used productively in, in organizations everywhere. All of them have the same problem. They need sales, they need marketing, they need project success coordination, they need a marketplace to help those projects become successful commercially. And so that's what Open Teams is, is an organization to basically help scale open source consulting. We started that really in 2020 and are currently growing that. Lots of ways it helps, but I'm gonna go quickly. Um, there's a, basically a way to think of it as a marketplace, think of it as an Amazon for open source uh, solutions. Uh, and it's still a work in progress. You go to the website, you don't see quite everything that we're trying to build, but it's what we're trying to build now over the next year or two. And a way to connect with developers, pay them, get them onboarded, contract to hire, recruiting, lots of things that solves for the open source community. Now, kind of at the end, I wanna talk about kind of my view of how open source proprietary can work. I see open source as foundations like the earth and the proprietary layer is an atmosphere. It's an atmosphere that actually feeds the earth and lets lit life live there, but it's only a thin layer that actually lives on top of a, a set of open source foundations. And you really want a system where the proprietary is interacting successfully with the open source foundations as well. So we want a, a thriving economy ensuring that open source survives. So open source communities create software that businesses use, which create products and services that other businesses use. The money comes back to businesses that use open source software pretty well. They sell stuff and the money comes back. We need a little more work on the business that use open source software coming back to open source communities. That's where some work is needed and some, so how do we do what do we do? Let's make it interesting, let's make it easy, let's make it useful. So that's what we're working on. And we have some success doing this with open teams, support and contract work for those businesses comes back to open teams, open teams funds and staffs and provides jobs for open source community participants, as well as um, there's other uh, rewards, and other activities actually. So we did this with Spider. Spider is a useful uh, a Spider is a um, basically an IDE, a development environment, a data environment for Python. And a lot of people like it. It gives them this place just to run and debug their code. But it's sustained by kind of a small group out of Columbia, basically. Columbia, not the university, but the country. And so we basically uh, uh, employ several of those folks and they and then several people create what we call community work orders that help uh, improve the features they care about and then open teams sends that work to quonsite that actually employs them so open teams is a marketplace that establishes relationships with employers of open source developers so i think of it as open source ecosystem as I like think of it as like waves think of it like wind think of it like i think often think about harnessing the niagara falls your tesla looking at niagara falls going there's amazing power here how do we harness this to provide electricity for the world in a way that's sustainable? And so you think about how do we ride that and how do I fight it? So um, I know we're out of time. And so I want to kind of, there are, there are a couple of ideas that are really critical. I think you have to recognize what kinds of open source work. Community driven is different than community backed, company backed. Community driven open source is more governed by a uh, crowd. Company backed is governed by a, pod, a program manager at a corporation. And they both have roles and they both have important things to offer, but they are a little bit different in how they uh, appear in the, in the market. Um, Fair OSS is an idea and I'm very excited about this. I'm not gonna go into detail, I'm just gonna leave this here for people that look at my slides later. If you recorded this, you can read it. I'm actually, this is my um, kind of 20 year goal. It's something we just started, but I do think we found a way so that Fair OSS can create a market for investment directly in open source, almost like an exchange market that'll really help add to the, to the solution of the big problem I see, which is trillions of investment dollars, millions of open source contributors, not connecting, right? Lots of open source innovation, lots of trillions of investment, and we're not connecting the dots very quickly and efficiently. So we need more market activities, more kinds of trades, more kind of marketplaces um, than just the current ones we have. And I think there's an idea here that potentially could work. Um, so we, you know, part of doing this is creating these, these, this venture fund. And so we actually have more than a fund we have what's called an incubator. If you have a, an idea, you wanna get off the ground, we can actually help you incubate that idea in 18 months to three years to build a company. So it's not accelerator, accelerators are 12 week things. This is something that you have an idea, you wanna work part-time, you don't have it, you can't afford to just go off full-time and, and be an entrepreneur. Incubator can provide an opportunity. So we're very excited about this. These are ideas that help us create commercial success around open source. Uh, so Quonset Initiate, it, that supports Faro Assess and is a, as a small fund, but we've already invested in 13 companies and doing better. So what takeaways can you do? I think you know sharing knowledge is more than just publishing papers behind paywalls. 
you know, share code, share data, and help reboot it too. I've seen lots of examples of that here in this session even. That's exciting. Uh, sharing credit for the code. Lots of people, that's what they, they trade on is basically their academic credit. So we need to make sure and share that. Uh, make infrastructure code libraries open source. I don't think everything should be open source. I think there are things that can be closed. There was a good talk on some of that today. And I, I agree with some of that. There's really important to deliver value. But ultimately libraries and infrastructure code does need to be open source. Uh, forcing people to come to your platform is, not a, is gonna struggle. People will pay for things like optimization, compute costs, management tools, those can be charged for. But people wanna be able at least to run a reference implementation of the code they're sharing for free. Um, so using higher level tools and languages, if you have public efforts, recognize the need to build a community. You, if you're gonna do this, you're not gonna do it alone. You're gonna have to kind of sponsor and support a community. Often it's not big things, it's little things. Small things can make a big differences in building and supporting the community. So um, you can do it today. You can actually dive into some code base that you're interested in and step back and think about what's missing to make things better for folks. Uh, definitely build on other, other work. You don't have to do it all. Look for what others are doing and build on it if you can and show and teach others what you do. Break things down to components and fail quickly. Just do something that's, uh, that's a componentized then, then see if it works, see what happens. And if you don't code, you can still help. Ensure the proprietary software you buy supports the open source it depends on. I think that's really critical actually. Those who are, who are making money from open source should be supporting the open source they depend on. Uh, and there's lots of ways to do that from donating to NumFocus to participating with Ferro SS to sponsoring and donating to teams that, that uh, help your code thrive. Even just the people you hire, giving them time to work on open source when you play with, when you pay them. Uh, there's lots of companies and nonprofits you can incur, you can work with now. Uh, and encourage the entrepreneurs you know. Uh, that's a great way to actually support, particularly entrepreneurs in the open source space. Um, excellent, so that's kind of all I wanted to talk about. I'm open to questions, and if there's any, any comments people have, I'd love to hear them. Thank you so much, Travis. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Um, I actually, I do have one question. Um, so with this workshop, the specifically about open science and MRI, we're really trying to make it a global workshop. Um, with your experience and talking about open source, I'm sure with thousands of people, um, do you think there's a difference in how societies or cultures view open science? It's interesting. Um, probably, uh, it's a good question. We actually, with NumFocus, we made it a, a, a nonprofit for open science. <laughs> like NumFocus was yeah. not a numerical, you know, uh, it, it was not just a coding nonprofit, actually, it was intentionally for the benefit for tools that help science. I think one of the challenges open science is also, uh, there's an academic, and I'd love to hear how people are doing on this. When I was an academic, there was so much, you, you was pressure to publish behind effectively what became paywalls. So, and, and, and I, so I, I, I saw somebody talk about the principles of open science. You have to one, give people concretely what you mean. What is it that they're supposed to do to make open science thrive? So what does that, what does that mean specifically? Yeah, so actually, I, the, one of the reasons I asked that is in the um, opening session 12 hours ago, we had David Norris, who's the editor of Magma, which is the European um, journal. And it was really interesting because he was giving us statistics about their a, trans, a transformative journal at the moment, and they're trying to become open access. Mm -hmm. And he had certain goals for the journal, but he was saying, and I thought this was interesting, he didn't go more into detail about it, but that he, he thought that the he thought in Europe they could hit these target goals, but he was worried about open access in America. And mm. he didn't really elaborate on that. Um, and I wasn't able to follow up. So I was just well, curious if you also it, had um, it, seen anything. It could like be, that. yeah, I, I have. I mean, Europe is a lot more open to the concept of open source infrastructure. The US is, but it almost looks a little different. Like, I think it's the impact of Silicon Valley basically, and also proprietary and then, in the United States, it's changing a little bit. We've had this notion that to commercialize means you have to have a proprietary company. So it's almost there's this mentality in both in some of the government agencies in Silicon Valley, and that's been there for 40 years. It is changing and it comes to open source, but effectively in order for this to be successful, really because of the same tragedy of the commons conversation I was just talking about, in order to be successful, you have to make it proprietary and you have to create a, a paywall. You have to create a, a, a nobody can access it. But in my mind, that's like, wait a minute, you've, you've just, you've assumed the problem, you're begging the question. Like you've assumed a solution to the problem. Yes, there is a problem, how do I make this sustainable? That's absolutely true. But you've also, you've assumed a solution to that that requires a certain kind of business model. That, that, that shouldn't be, there's a lot of business models that still would work. 
that allow people to be paid, allow people to work, and allows um, benefit to you know uh, the benefit to transfer. So I, I would say, um, you know, in Europe they've been more open to that early, and partly because they've kind of rejected more of the. It's sort of because they're on one side or the other on, on the socialist sense. I think they've been more open to socialism, and I think they're making mistakes as well. They're just different kinds of mistakes. That's why I think it's kind of we have to kind of look beyond the the, the previous. Um, what history has given us and look deeper into um, what we're learning from current interactions. That's to me has been a phenomenon that's interesting is it's not that I'm just theorizing about this. It's just basically how are people behaving? And there's a, it's a lot easier to understand how people are behaving and then react to it. So we need more entrepreneurship around how people are actually behaving kind of less. We do this because it's always been done and more, you know, why do you do this? Well, because this is the thing we're solving. Okay, great. And then what's the data? What's the experiment we can do to, to have another turn of the crank? So I, you know, and that's entrepreneurship at its core. And even if you're a big business and an established business, you have to be constantly kind of learning. I mean, so, um, uh, Amazon, one of the massive companies, well, partly they're massive because they keep iterating. Google talks about they're a learning company, right? As long as a company keeps learning and iterating, it becomes better. And that's true for anything. So I think, um, I think one, having a mission, you know, open science has like an awesome mission and keep iterating the mission. And then it definitely helps to, I, I say in-person definitely helps to come together. It's one of those things we've been struggling with the pandemic is it's harder to get together in person. So virtual has some benefits, but there's nothing like kind of being in a room with people and kind of sharing a, a core vision and getting people, that can, that can last for about a year, right? Even yeah. once a year is good, <laughs> but just that, that, that in-person. <laughs> Connection can be super helpful. Yeah, when um, Andres Maslow showed the slides for 3D Slice, there were those community rooms with people yeah. coding. I was like, oh, it's been a few years since I've been in a situation <laughs> like that. It's so true. Um, so true. There was another question in the chat. Um, uh, whoops, it's moving. Um, thank you, Travis, for a great talk. Question, what can academia do to support open source more? Yeah, that's a great question. There's some really good work being done with um, I say uh, like open access journals, like I would say academia should give academic credit for open source support. Now it does not, you can still have to write a paper. You can still need to write up the, the results or something, but like giving credit instead of saying, oh, that's just a report on open source. That's not academic credit. Like absolutely it should be. You should sort of there, give credit for academic, for supporting a, a open source. I think the tenure committees absolutely need to do that. That's that's been changing, fortunately, over the past ten years since I was in that position. But it's definitely if you're involved in academia at all, recognize it still has to be judged. That's like every contribution to open source is the same. You can still evaluate the merits of that contribution, but recognize that open source contribution is usually even more valuable than necessarily just publishing a paper that nobody read. So um, you kind of have this defaults need to change. I also think that funding. I think if you're if you're if you're getting an academic grant, and often people will oh put a line item on their academic grant to pay for software, on your academic grant line item, provide support for a nonprofit, put a support for a, a community work order to help improve the software you're depending on. Like there are things you can do to actually channel funds from funding institutions to open source as an academic. Right, you can basically just put as a line item on your grant request, and that's that's fantastic. That's been happening more and more. I'd love to see, I work with some academic colleagues to see if we can't get the funding agencies to recognize the need for that. Like, don't just give money to, like right now what's happening is, oh, if I use a proprietary software, then I can get grant money to pay that, to pay for that proprietary software. But if you open source a software, how do I get grant money to pay for that? It's not as, as deeply connected. And so how do we do that? So that's something that can, I think concretely that can happen too. And then um, encourage students, like your students, I think it's a great way for students to get associated with communities. You have to balance it. You don't want your students, in many cases, I think of my PhD professors probably didn't love that I was contributing to open source rather than promoting their careers by writing more papers. <laughs> but I, I did do both. I did uh, write a bunch of uh, papers as well. But so you want to encourage students to kind of broaden their horizons. I think that'll help them because only some of your students are going to be academics anyway. And this helps many of your students will have uh, successful careers outside of academia. 
if I may quickly interject, uh, I am from Europe, at least geographically, as I'm based in uh, Switzerland. And uh, indeed, the culture uh, also towards open science is probably a little bit different. So a lot of things that you are mentioning um, are being implemented, maybe halfway, maybe not completely, but funding bodies now recognize open source contributions uh, and, uh, and packages as part That's of awesome. the career. And uh, uh, they, Europe is in ahead some of cases, it. Yeah, and in some cases, they even require that you publish your code open source. Uh, what is halfway there is that uh, uh, they will pay you to do the research project. And then also you have to uh, release your uh -huh. code open source. So they don't really pay you to do open source development, but they require you to do that. <laughs> um, Fair enough. But uh, yeah. well, we'll get there at some point, I guess. Yeah, I think that's an excellent, uh, thank you. That's excellent here. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so, Laura, shall we wrap up this fantastic yeah. session? Yeah. Yeah. So, as I mentioned, I'm from Europe. Uh, um, here it's uh, three fifteen a.m. Uh, when uh, Laura told me that I should uh, be awake for this session, I said I told her this better be a, be a good one and. Uh, she did deliver. Uh, I was really blown away by these fantastic talks. Uh, I had lots of fun.